You can see how many people are here outside of Trump Tower. Michelle, take a look behind me. These are officers with long guns, and officers just like this have been placed at several locations throughout New York City. City Mayor Bill de Blasio calling this a cowardly act of terror. Very active scene still hours after, as you can see here behind me. Police are still here investigating, trying to piece together exactly what happened. Michelle, authorities are saying that those victims range in age from just 17 months old to 77 years old. They're saying that the shooter came into the church and looked pew by pew searching for victims. Well, Michelle, you can see that I'm near the massive iconic bull here on Wall Street, and you can see that there's actually a pink hat on it. Welcome to Paris, one of the largest cities in the world, or is it? You can see some of the sights of the city behind me. It's all part of a display you'll see at Gulliver's Gate. Derek, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio calling this a cowardly act of terror. Very active scene still hours after, as you can see here behind me. Police are still here investigating, trying to piece together exactly what happened. Witnesses describing a scene of horror, and we're learning new details about the man you just mentioned, the suspect here, Saifulo Saipov, reportedly from Uzbekistan, who had an ID from Tampa, Florida, a 29-year-old man who came to the United States in 2010. Sources do say that Saipov had a green card and notes pledging his loyalty to ISIS were found near the truck on the scene. According to sources, Saipov plowed the truck into people on a bike path that runs along West Side Highway in Lower Manhattan and hit multiple people and then continued along that path hitting a school bus. Early reports say that two people in that bus were among the injured. Witnesses also say that the the vehicle could not move, so the suspect got out and started shooting using imitation firearms. We're talking about a pellet gun and a paintball gun, according to authorities. Saipov was then shot by NYPD officers. He is in the hospital and is expected to survive. Authorities are also releasing details about the truck used in this attack. You can see in the video just how smashed up it is. The truck, a rental from Home Depot, a hardware store. And Home Depot did confirm, according to investigators, that it is indeed one of their trucks. Home Depot saying that they will cooperate with the investigation. Authorities saying, as Derek mentioned, that this is apparently a lone wolf attack and nothing suggests that this is part of a wider plot. But New Yorkers can expect to see increased security out here in locations across the city in the coming days, as we would imagine after an attack like this, Derek. Horrible. Um, there's still an emptiness because we were married 26 years. Eric Garner's widow is still in pain nearly four years after his death. Don't touch me. Came over. Don't touch me. Eric Garner died at the age of 43. His last moments alive were recorded on cell phone video. He yelled, as he was put in a police chokehold by Officer Daniel Pantaleo of the New York Police Department. Pantaleo confronted Garner for allegedly selling loose cigarettes, which is illegal in New York City. Garner's death sparked nationwide protests. The officer responsible for killing him never went to trial. He should have been prosecuted and sentenced to life in prison. But a new docudrama is showing what could have happened if the case was tried in front of a jury. Do you need some time? Garner's wife testifies in the film American Trial. The mock trial features a judge, a jury, real life witnesses, and testimony from medical experts. Hearing that um, his chest and his neck was crushed. Nobody cares that he was screaming. They don't even treat dogs like that. James Knight was Eric Garner's friend for the last seven years of his life. Well, see, me and him, we used to go lunchtime. Our thing was Popeyes. He was there when Garner took his last gasp for air and jumped at the chance to be part of the docudrama and testified to highlight what he calls injustices by law enforcement. I would love to carry on a message that would probably last for, you know, that would make a change. If it makes a change, fantastic. Roy Messinger is a director of American Trial. He's been working on the project for the last few years. It started in my head uh, right on the day that the grand jury decided not to prosecute. Former prosecutors play the role of real prosecutors in the mock trial. They say they hope it gives the public an accurate account of what happened to Garner. Look, I think if you're approaching this project objectively, the idea is not to be a heated, heated partisan on either side. 
Daniel Pantaleo, the NYPD officer responsible for Garner's death, was portrayed by an actor. Some real-life witnesses to Garner's death did not testify in the mock trial due to an ongoing criminal investigation by the Department of Justice. I've given up all hope, all faith in the Department of Justice. Garner's death was ruled a homicide. Although Officer Pantaleo was never indicted, the city agreed to pay a $6 million civil settlement to the Garner family. But Garner's daughter says that was never enough. Money is not justice, and I'd rather have my father than the money. But you kill a man in cold blood, and you, you still live and you still breathe it, and I have nothing but memory. Michelle, take a look behind me. These are officers with long guns, and officers just like this have been placed at several locations throughout New York City. They've been placed outside here at the British Consulate. We're also told the officers have been placed at Grand Central Station and New York's City Hall. I want to show you a picture of what I saw during my commute on the way here. This is actually the subway station in Times Square, and you can see that increased police presence there. It's believed that there is an increased presence there today as well following the attack that we've been telling you about all day. I want to show you some video outside of the British consulate earlier, and police say that bomb-detecting dogs have also been deployed at some of those locations that we did mention earlier. And right now, this increased presence has a lot of people concerned across the city, but NYPD says that they just want to make sure that they're keeping everybody safe. The response in New York is being called routine. NYPD's chief spokesperson says that the response is not related to any specific or credible threat in the city. We are told that NYPD is gathering real-time intelligence from their officers stationed in London, and they say that NYPD has an intelligence gathering presence in several overseas cities to help obtain information in situations just like this one. After the attack, NYPD counterterrorism tweeted, we are monitoring the developing situation in London. But you can see here these guards, these officers with long guns are still here outside of the British consulate. There's no word on how long this increased police presence will be here. But of course, we will continue to follow this and let you know what happens. Michelle. Victor Raponte is a straight A student, but he hasn't always had a home. Recently, he's had to bounce back and forth between homeless shelters while trying to juggle seventh grade. I don't really like it, but it's whatever. I, I'm not really stressed about it. When we first met Victor in October, he traveled an hour and 30 minutes to get from a homeless shelter in Queens to a school in the Bronx. In December, after two months of struggles, he and his dad finally found a shelter closer to his school. But Victor wasn't alone, trying to get classes in an entirely different borough miles away from home. That's because if a family is fortunate enough to get a spot at a homeless shelter in the city, that shelter may not be near their school. It's just mind-boggling to me. Naitika Alexander and his daughter Zakia Lee dealt with the same battle. And, and how does it make you feel when you, when you go to school? Happy, but when I come back to school and go to this place, it's made me sad. Alexander travels more than 45 minutes to get his daughter from this homeless shelter in the Bronx to her school. Alexander also says he has to pull his daughter from classes to apply for changes to housing. When I miss school, it's like, make me sad because I'm missing my education. James Macklin is an advocate for the homeless. It breaks my heart. It should break any decent human being's heart to hear about a child being homeless. Macklin is also the director of outreach at the Bowery Mission, a shelter that's not run by the city. He let us see the inside of what the mission looks like, where people sleep, shower, and eat. According to The Economist, there were 63,000 people living in homeless shelters in New York City in 2017. New York City Councilman Rafael Espinal says the affordable housing crisis is forcing people from their homes, making it impossible to find places to live. Uh, we have to continue finding ways where we continue incentivizing landlords uh, to keep families in their homes and also developers to continue building the maximum amount of affordable housing they can. That's the only way we're going to get these children uh, out of our shelters. Do you think it's more difficult to study for students who stay in shelters? What do you see in your experience? Yes, I believe it's more difficult to study for them to study because, you know, always in the back of their head is the question of where am I going to lay down? Where am I going to go to sleep? Meanwhile, families like Natika Alexander hope to find a permanent place to call home much closer to school. As for Aponte, he says he's glad it doesn't take him an hour and a half to get to school. Yeah, it's still fun, but it's a lot better.